Hello there, listeners. Welcome back. My name is Stephanie Safarian, and you're listening to episode 335 of Sustainable Minimalists, a twice-weekly show about intentional and eco-minimalist living. On today's show, I am outlining 10 life lessons that minimalism has taught me over the years. I was looking at old photos the other night, and I was struck by how differently I used to do things, how I used to live before I found minimalism, or I should say before minimalism found me. And so I made a post about it on social media. I asked, you know, should I cover this in an episode? And the answer from all of you was a resounding yes. And so today we're talking about 10 life lessons minimalism has taught me and has perhaps taught you as well. I did want to cover this topic today because I believe it is so important for all of us on our own respective journeys to look back so that we can see how far we've come. And I do invite all of you to ask yourself today as you're listening, what did you do before embracing sustainable minimalism that maybe today makes you cringe? What lessons has your journey taught you? Ignore the cringe of how you used to do things and instead celebrate your progress. Celebrate how far you've come. So today we're covering 10 lessons I've come to believe are true. They are in no particular order, and I hope they resonate with you. We are starting with lesson number one, and it is super deep. (laughs) We're really just cutting that onion. We're not peeling back layers of the onion. We're cutting the onion in half, and we're getting down to the core of it, to my biggest lesson of all, which is, of course, lesson number one, it's all a ruse. All right. I used to shop for entertainment. I was bored. I'd go to the mall. Nothing to do. Go to the mall. Meeting a friend. Let's meet at the mall. When my husband and I were thinking about buying our first home together, I don't even think he was my husband at this point, but this was back in about, you know, 2010-ish when there was this new um, fad hitting America in which Nice, fancy condos were being built next to fancy malls, and then there'd be like a walkway from the condo straight to the mall. So essentially, you're living at the mall. (laughs) My husband and I did indeed tour a few of these fancy condo units that were a stone's throw from the mall. I could not these days ever imagine living at a mall because these days I avoid the mall like the plague. And so lesson number one is it's all a ruse because once you see through the marketing glitz and glamour, once the veil is lifted, you can't unsee it. For me, it's similar to the Wizard of Oz. The wizard behind the curtain is a fraud. The promises that new stuff offer us from the windows of our favorite shopping mall stores Those promises are smoke and mirrors. It's all a ruse. There is no thing. There's no item. There is no new it fad or possession that is going to solve our problems, make us prettier, make us happier, make us healthier. That hard work comes from within. So let's just get the big one right out of the way. Lesson number one, it's all a ruse. And then let's move on to lesson number two. And that is, that experiences rule and memories reside in our minds, not in stuff. So experiences rule and memories reside in our minds, not in things. So this is a long one. There's a little bit of a rambling that's about to happen, but stay with me. It'll all make sense, I promise. When I was a kid and it was Christmas or it was my birthday and I was getting gifts, I always beelined for the biggest gifts first, like so in in size, physical size, the biggest gifts first, because I assumed incorrectly that the best gifts were the biggest ones. And even when I became a young adult, that belief that bigger is better, that belief morphed a bit, but it really still hung around in my brain because I always believed and I always wanted a physical gift, something that I could hold, something that I could take ownership of. I believed that a physical gift was preferable to a less tangible experience gift for whatever reason. 
I remember very specifically, I was living in New York City for college. And for Christmas one year, someone in my life gave me a Metro card. A Metro card is a subway card. It is essentially a ticket to wherever my imagination wants to take me. It's a literal experience ticket. And at this point in my life where I am at 38 years old, I look back on that Metro card and I think, wow, what an amazing and thoughtful gift for a broke college kid. The gifter had to likely jump through a bunch of hoops to obtain the Metro card. And that's to say nothing for the thought that they put into the gift. But at the time, I remember feeling a little bit disappointed. And I cringe when I say that out loud because that's gross. (laughs) That's a gross way of looking at the world, right? I desired something tangible. I could not see the immense possibilities for life enrichment that that Metro card that I held in my hot little hand held for me. I didn't appreciate it at the time, and I wish I had been a better person back then so that I could have appreciated the gift the way it deserved to be appreciated. Because these days, experiences are everything, really, in my view. Life is for the living. It's meant to be lived. Life is not about amassing trinkets and overflowing your house. My grandmother used to say this perfectly. She used to say, quote, you can't take it with you, (laughs) which is a little bit morbid, but it essentially means that you're going to die. We're all going to die. And the stuff is not going to matter. We can't take it with us. I always think about that. I have no idea how long I'm going to be on this earth, but you can best believe I'm going to make the most out of my days by living my best life. And Holly on Facebook said this makes sense to her. She used to think that spending money on things that weren't physical items was a waste. She wouldn't want to spend money to go on a vacation or travel because she'd have nothing to show for it. Now looking back, Holly says even just having those thoughts makes her cringe. And now the only gifts she wants are experience gifts. She feels like she's led a very small life and she feels like she's missed out on a lot because of her old way of thinking. And so bringing this back around to lesson number two, which is experiences rule and memories reside in our minds, it's important to remember that the memories from our experiences do not reside in things. They don't reside in souvenirs or trinkets. I talk a lot about my teapot collection on this show. And really quick, I'm going to talk about it one more time for new listeners. Back when I used to travel and I was cool and I had a life, I would buy a teapot from wherever I was. And I had a teapot collection. I believed that I needed the teapot. I needed the souvenir to remind myself that I had a great time. Well, These days, I very rarely buy a souvenir. I can't tell you, actually, the last time I bought a souvenir. The emphasis is no longer on the souvenir. It's more on memorializing the experience, the great time, with photographs, right? Photos are a literal snapshot of a moment in time. What an invention when you stop and think about it. So we know we have a good time because we have a brain and we can store memories in our brains. However, memories and our brains are not infallible. Photographs are the best way to memorialize those great times. We do not need a thing to remind us that we had a great time. That's what photographs are for. And speaking of photos, if you have a cell phone that's overflowing with thousands and thousands of pictures and screenshots and ugly photos that you didn't mean to take. Perhaps going back at the start of every month to the previous month and deleting doubles or the uglies or etc. This is digital minimalism at its finest, keeping only the best of the best digital memorializations, right? I had to go back in my phone a few weeks ago to find a very specific photo from five-ish years ago. (laughs) The photo that I was looking for got lost in the junk and the minutia of unimportant photos and screenshots that I frankly should have deleted. So consider going back and deleting the photos that you don't need to keep. Keep the best of the best. Lesson number two, experiences rule and memories reside not in things, 
That's number two. Let's go on to number three. Save so that you can spend on what matters. And in this, so save so you can spend on what matters. And specifically in this lesson, I'm speaking about food. I used to penny pinch the heck out of food. I would buy as little as possible. I would buy the cheapest things, not the things that were on sale. I would buy those too, but the cheapest items. I would then, in the same breath, I would go out and drop boatloads of money on random junk. (laughs) I think back now and I just can't imagine. I've said before on the show, you know, we tend to, as a society, cut coupons for food and penny pinch at the grocery store. But then there's a whole subset of us who think nothing about dropping hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of dollars on a handbag. That is so backwards to me. These days, I spend extra money on food. I also stock up on food. Minimalism is all about getting rid of the excess, but food is the one area in which I readily embrace maximalism. I actually did a podcast episode on this, actually a conversation with a guest. Her name was Kelly Morris. Changed my life in this regard. It was episode number 96. It was about self-sufficiency. I will link to it in the show notes, but Kelly's point was that these days, my generation, perhaps your generation, we are a generation or two removed from crisis, and we're heavily dependent on products that make our lives easier. This makes us vulnerable, and so preparing for job loss or an illness or a weather disaster, that's not futile. That's smart. And one of the best and fastest ways we can prepare for the unexpected is to have a stockpile of food and water on hand. These days, I buy high-quality food most of the time because I know that I'm privileged and I have the resources to do so. And I also stock up on food. I have a deep freezer. I taught myself how to can. I store food in strange places in my house. I store water in my house just in case. And so if money in your home does not grow on trees, it certainly doesn't grow on the trees in my yard, (laughs) if money is a finite resource, why not save, so don't spend money on random stuff that you don't need, so that you can spend on what's essential? Okay, so that's lesson number three. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to get to lesson number four, which is cost per use over cost. See you in a minute. Organic and truly healthy food choices at my local supermarket are sadly limited. And more times than not, I find myself forced to either fork over an awful lot of money or compromise my food values. These days, Thrive Market is my go-to for grocery staples, and that's because I can always find exactly what I'm looking for for less money. Here's a quick example. Primal Kitchen is my go-to brand for ketchup because their ketchup is made with organic ingredients and without pesky hidden sugar. Its sticker price is $6.69 at my local grocery store. But at Thrive Market, the same exact product is over $1 less. Join Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash sustainable for 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash sustainable. Thrivemarket.com slash sustainable. You've got New Year's goals and HelloFresh is here to help you achieve them. With over 35 weekly recipes, HelloFresh has what you're looking for to help you achieve your goals. Choose calorie smart and carb smart recipes. And remember that HelloFresh is so much cheaper than takeout. I generally love to cook for my family, but sometimes I just don't have the time or the energy to cook from scratch. In these moments, I rely on HelloFresh because my kids get a healthy and tasty meal and I don't get frazzled trying to figure out what on earth to serve them. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit for a reason. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Sustainable21 and use code Sustainable21 for 21 free meals 
plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash Sustainable21 for 21 free meals and free shipping. If you're not sleeping on bed sheets with viscose from bamboo yet, what on earth are you waiting for? I used to be a cotton bed sheets type of girl, and then I tried Caraloha's soft and sustainable bedding made from viscose from bamboo. You guys, the difference is huge. It is one of the softest and comfiest fabrics on the planet. They're also cooler. Viscose from bamboo fabrics are three degrees cooler than non-bamboo fabrics, and they're naturally moisture wicking, which means they're lightweight and breathable. And even my husband, who, let's be real, he generally does not care too much about our bed sheets, but even he prefers our Caraloha sheets over our humdrum cotton ones. Caraloha is giving our listeners 25% off their order by using code SUSTAINABLE. The code does not last forever, so hurry and head to C-A-R-I-L-O-H-A dot com and use code SUSTAINABLE to receive 25% off your order. And we're back on today's show. We're discussing life lessons minimalism has given me Lesson number one, just to recap, was it's all a ruse. Lesson number two, memories reside in our minds and photos, not in things. And lesson number three was save so you can spend on what matters. We're on to lesson four, which is cost per use over price tag sticker. Now, I know the privilege problem comes into play here in a major way. For some of us, cost is the only consideration that matters because finances are tight. I get it. I get it. But for me and my stage of life, and while I must certainly consider cost, it is not my number one consideration. Sometimes it's not even in the top three considerations, to be honest. Materials matter. So what the thing is made of matters. Quality matters. Supporting a business that has sustainability ingrained in its mission matters. Voting with my dollars matters. The afterlife considerations of the product matters. And so when it comes to cost, I would argue that cost per use matters so much more than the price tag alone. In my book, I have a book. It's called Sustainable Minimalism. I use the wool sweater example, and I'm going to use that again just because I think it's a really good example. You could buy a synthetic plastic sweater, synthetic means plastic sweater, for $25. It doesn't keep you all that warm because synthetics traditionally are not great insulators. So you pay $25 for this sweater, let's just say five times total because then it starts to pill after a wear and it doesn't serve its utility of keeping you warm. So you wear it five times, $25 sweater, 25 divided by five. The cost per use is $5. Let's compare that synthetic sweater with a wool sweater. Well, of course, the wool sweater is warmer, right? The wool sweater is made from natural materials. Wool is a natural insulator. That wool sweater, of course, is also more expensive. Let's say that sweater is $100. But because wool is a natural insulator, it actually does its job. It serves its utility of keeping you warm. It also lasts so much longer, right? So let's say you wear that sweater 50 times. Holy moly, 50 times. $100 divided by 50 wears. Cost per use of that sweater is $2. So the synthetic Sweater has a price tag of $25, sounds cheaper, but if you're only going to get five wears out of it and the cost per use is $5, that's more expensive than the wool sweater that had a higher sticker price, but you're using it more, you're getting more use out of it because that cost per use for the wool sweater only came to $2. So next time you're at a store or next time you're shopping online, I suggest you get out your calculator and you figure out an item's cost per use. We all have a calculator in our pockets these days, don't we? Thanks, smartphones. Get out your calculator, find the sticker price, and if there's like shipping and taxes included, add those as well, and then estimate how often you're going to use or wear the item. There's your cost per use, so sticker price plus any taxes, fees, delivery, shipping stuff, that price 
divided by how often you estimate using or wearing the item. That's your cost per use. You're going to get a number. Then ask yourself, is the purchase worth it now? Dun, dun, dun. Let me know. So cost per use over price tag sticker if you can afford it, if you've got privilege. We're on to lesson number five, which is a personal one. And that is buying new as a last resort makes me happy. It leads to happiness. Buying new used to be my first resort, right? Our culture tends to tell us. No, it doesn't tend to tell us. It tells us. It teaches us. It grooms us is the best way to say this. Our culture grooms us to believe that buying new should be our first and only resort. I never questioned this up until I was age 30, to be completely honest. I bought whatever I could afford. I never thought about doing anything differently. I was a cog in the wheel. I would buy books instead of requesting them from the library. If I was going on a trip and I had a flight, I never you know, went to the library first and got a book. I just knew that I would go to Hudson News at the airport and pick up something that looked good, right? I would, again, go to the mall. I would buy new clothes so that I could, I don't know, impress people and make myself feel good about myself, I guess. If I need something these days, my first stop is my local buy nothing group without fail. Don't pass go. Don't collect $200. Buy nothing group first. And then if I can't find it there, I'm asking to borrow what I'm looking for from my tribe. I'm looking to reuse something I already have. You know the deal. We talk about it all the time on these shows. Buying new as a last resort is an environmentally friendly practice, of course. But it can also be profoundly satisfying on a personal level. You all write to me about this all the time. Living in a way that's aligned with your values reduces anxiety, reduces shame, gives you a sense of efficacy. It makes you feel as though you're making a difference. It keeps your home clutter-free. It reduces your mental load. It makes you feel proud of yourself, makes you feel inventive almost. So there is personal gains to be had when you jump off the bandwagon of buying new, and you make buying new your last resort. That's lesson number five. Lesson number six, okay, emphasizing extras keeps us cluttered. What does this mean? (laughs) This is a mindset that I definitely grew up with in my household. We would sometimes go to the dollar store and stock up on cheap items that we already had, Just in case something broke, we would have extras on hand. A nameless listener wrote in on Instagram and said that she used to buy eight to 10 sippy cups and water bottles so that she always had extras on hand. She never wanted to be without because being without something can be scary, right? There's a major difference, though, between being prepared and being overprepared. There's a major difference between having enough with some wiggle room in case something breaks and having too much. It's a line in the sand and the line, the location of the line is different for each and every one of us. But I do believe it is important to remember when deciding where your line falls that we live in a world in which you can get whatever you need in two days or less for better or for worse. So do we need to keep extras on hand, which often keeps us cluttered, if we can get what we need in a dire emergency in two days at the maximum, at the maximum, right? If you need something immediately, you can go to the store and get it. But at the maximum, if you don't want to leave your house in two days, like, do we really need to keep an exorbitant amount of extras on hand in 2023. Something to think about. We're moving on to lesson number seven, which is that sometimes you cannot recoup worth. So many of us hold on to items for way too long because we want to get back what we paid or we want to recoup at least part of an item's financial worth. 
This mindset leads to overflowing basements and attics and garages because sometimes, perhaps even oftentimes, it's impossible to recoup worth. The reason why it's impossible to recoup worth is because goods are way too abundant in 2023. It's supply and demand personified. When supply is overflowing, demand nosedives. If you want to, down the line, recoup some worth, make sure you're buying or amassing quality items at the outset, but know, too, that there is no guarantee here. What was in demand 10 or 20 or 50 years ago is very likely not in demand today. I'm thinking our Beanie Baby collections. I'm thinking our Hummels. I'm thinking fine china. I could go on and on with things that were valuable once that we held on to that nobody wants today. Nobody. It is so unlikely with these examples that I just gave and more that you are going to recoup anywhere close to what you paid. I remember the Beanie Baby fad of... I must have been the 90s sometime, early 90s perhaps. My mom, God bless her, she would bring us to the store. She would drop $12, $20 on the new Beanie Baby for us because we all believed that that thing was going to appreciate in value. Did it appreciate in value? No. Those items depreciated so fast. And so they say, and they are people much smarter than me, they, whoever they are, say that a brand new car loses approximately 10% of its value the moment you drive it off the lot. You've heard that, right? Let's start applying that logic to everything we buy. But for reality's sake, let's up that percentage to 75%, okay? 75%, to be honest, is a conservative estimate and definitely more in line with 2023 realities. So would you buy that new Waterford vase, if you knew that in 25 years, you'll get a quarter of what you paid for it, would you walk out of the store with that brand new Waterford vase if you knew that the moment you stepped your toes outside the store, it would lose 75% of its value? That vase, that crystal fancy vase, it doesn't seem so fancy anymore, (laughs) does it? Lesson number eight is related to lesson number seven. Lesson number eight is that space is more valuable than stuff and peace of mind is the most valuable thing of all. It's related to number seven. We're going to take a second break and when we come back, we're going to get into lesson number eight. We talk about laundry detergent an awful lot on this podcast. So you already know that those gigantic plastic detergent jugs rarely get recycled, and over 700 million jugs wind up in our landfills every single year. Yikes. EarthBreeze EcoSheets solve the plastic jug problem and go further. For me in my home, I love that EarthBreeze's formula actually cleans my clothes because ain't nobody wants to do laundry twice. (laughs) And the fact that their packaging is completely plastic free is the cherry on top. If you don't like their detergent sheets for whatever reason, they will give you a full refund and you don't even have to send the product back. Right now, my listeners can subscribe and get 40% off. Go to earthbreeze.com slash sustainable to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash sustainable for 40% off. earthbreeze.com slash sustainable. And we're back, friends. Before the break, we were discussing lesson seven, which is sometimes you just cannot recoup worth. And related to that is lesson number eight. Space is more valuable than stuff, and peace of mind is the most valuable thing of all. All right. So let's say you have had a death in your family. And if you have, my sincere condolences. So you've had a death in your family. You're reluctant to give away your deceased loved one's items because they're, quote, worth something. Well, your time, your energy, your own home's space considerations, these are also worth something. And they're worth, in many cases, I'd argue, more than the stuff you're considering absorbing into your own collection of possessions. 
Do you really have the time and the energy needed to sell these items for a premium? What about space? What will happen to your quality of life, your peace of mind, if you squeeze someone else's items into your living space? Homes are for living, not for accumulating. I used to buy shoes for quantity, not quality. And this practice led to a closet full of uncomfortable and poorly made shoes that I wore maybe once, maybe twice, maybe never, right? They're uncomfortable. I'm thinking like pay less quality. Who wants to walk around, wear pay less quality shoes all day long? Not me as a 38-year-old. Heck no. If I could close the door to my closet full of shoes, that was fine. I didn't care what was happening within the closet. I have come to realize, thanks to minimalism though, that space, that having room to breathe, room to move around, that space enables me to actually enjoy my home. And when my home is my haven, when my home is my sanctuary, my home in turn gives back to me something invaluable, which is my peace of mind. So lesson number eight, space is more valuable than stuff. And peace of mind is the most valuable thing of all. We're moving on to lesson nine. It's not a deal if you don't need it. Listener Taylor wrote in and said she used to amass t-shirts and random pens and other crap she could get from any trip or conference or vacation she was going on. And listener Holly echoed the sentiment. Holly said she used to always accept freebies. It didn't matter what they were or if she needed them. Being free was all that mattered. And now Holly says she finds herself constantly refusing these items. For me, my Achilles heel was hotel shampoo and lotions. (laughs) I'd go to a hotel, I'd stay over, I would take all those freebies. But now I've learned about the potentially harmful chemicals in these products. I'm very particular about the personal care items I use on myself and my children. And so now I'm kicking myself because I took this stuff home. I didn't need it. I don't want it anymore. But now I have this responsibility to consciously and carefully dispose of it or pass it on. I've got to do something kind with this stuff instead of throwing it in the trash. And the reason for that is because when we allow items into our home and we assume ownership over them, We as sustainable minimalists understand that we then have a responsibility to care for such items through their respective ends of life. And that is a hefty responsibility, isn't it? Especially if you consider the statistic that the average American household has over 300,000 items. That's 300,000 responsibilities. Holy moly. So these days, if you're like Taylor and you're like Holly and you're like me, You're not accepting the freebies if you don't need them because that's just more responsibility on our already overflowing plates. Phew, I'm getting tired just thinking about 300,000 responsibilities. We're on to lesson number 10. And lesson number 10 is perhaps, in my opinion, the most important one of all, and that is how we live matters. I get a lot of emails from all of you. And the overflowing majority of these emails are thank you emails. You're thanking me for teaching you something. You're thanking me for providing you motivation or camaraderie, perhaps. And I'm not saying this to say I'm really popular (laughs) or anything like that. I'm saying this all because these emails remind me that our actions and our thoughts and our beliefs They are all interconnected, but it's important to remember that your choices affect others. They affect animals. They affect ecosystems. They affect the future. They affect other people, and other people are watching how you live your life. Your children are watching. Your friends and family are watching. Random strangers are watching how you conduct your life, and they're learning from you. Your efforts within your home, outside of your home, they fuse with mine and they fuse with others on the same journey as us. And together, all of us, we can and we do every single day create ripples of change that extend beyond ourselves. 
It's impossible, unfortunately, to quantify this collective influence, but we do have to, at the end of the day, just trust that we are indeed making a difference. I believe, I continue to believe, I've been doing this for almost five years now, I believe that sustainable minimalism provides renewed hope for my children and your children, and that's why I continue to do this every single week. I so hope this episode gave you renewed hope and vigor on your own sustainable minimalist journey. There's no final word today because I feel like this whole episode was a final word. I will say that on Tuesday, we are discussing, get excited, we're discussing algae microalgae, macroalgae, everything in between. Algae is the next big thing in sustainability circles, but is it worth the hype? We're doing a defend the eco trend as it relates to algae on Tuesday. I will see you then. Reach out if you need me. Say hello. Say you're mad at me. Tell me something random, something good that's going on in your life. Reach out. The way to do that's in the show notes, mamaminimalist.com forward slash 335. See you Tuesday and take care.